the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. After this Holy Mass, there will be a, a short catechism, uh, most, mostly dealing with the crisis of our dear society, St. Pius X. Uh, and also pray for uh, Mr. Green, who is in the hospital. Uh, I was told Father Novak is there, and he is dying. So I'll pray for him in this holy sacrifice of the Mass. The first word of the angel, St. Gabriel, to the Blessed Virgin Mary, after the very long time, 5,000 years from Adam and Eve, to the time of the Virgin Mary. The Roman Martyrology says about 5,000 years. The Virgin Mary was greeted by the angel How. The angel, the first word that broke that long, long silence, that long absence from the closeness of God, the longing of the fathers and the prophets who foretold the Redeemer would come, but he didn't come yet. And all the sacrifices of the Old Testament, the lamb, the blood of the goats, the blood of the bulls being sprinkled, and all the holocaust, all this prefigured the one great event of Jesus crucified. That is the great prayer. And God foretold the role of the Virgin Mary, as you know well the great words which are on the crest of Bishop de Castro Bayer, who was a great, as you know, he was a great battler for the Catholic faith and tradition in Brazil. And on his crest it says, Ipsa conteret, she shall crush the head of the serpent. And God foretold the role of Mary in, in this prophecy, in Genesis chapter 3. So what did the angel say? What was the, the word that broke that silence? The first word was Ave. <coughs> Ave. Which in Latin means hail. But it's deeper than that, as the fathers of the church explain, especially St. Irenaeus. Ave, what is it backwards? Eva. Eve. The first Eve, by her disobedience to God and Adam, brought the human race to death, to destruction, to sickness, to sin, to slavery, to sin. But the role of the Virgin Mary will be to restore. And so the angel greets her with, with the word of Eva backwards, put back in right order. Ave. Maria, hail Mary. And the angel greeting, I mean the angels as you know, they are infinitely above us. Their powers far exceed us. The angel's intellect is so keen. They know the chess game and they know every single move, every possible move, every possible loss, every possible win, just by hearing chess. The intelligence of the angel far surpasses us. So here the Virgin Mary is, is troubled because an angel is greeting her. And the Virgin Mary, her role, as in the eyes of God, was tremendous. And with that first greeting, Ave Maria, gracia plena, filled with grace from her immaculate conception, from the moment of her immaculate conception, the Virgin Mary's role is to crush Satan's head. Satan is very proud, and because of his angelic gifts, he was very intelligent, he was the highest of the angels. And because of his rebellion against God, I will not serve, that was the first act of liberalism, which is, liberalism is defined as uh, any, seeking any domain to be freed from God, which is impossible, because Everything we have, everything we are, the gravity, our breath, our intelligence, our will, our body, our soul, it's all from God. So to think out of God is just is, is absurd. So for Lucifer to rebel against God was, was a horrible rebellion against the truth. So Lucifer was cast out 
And the role of the Virgin Mary was foretold. That her role would be to conquer him. Now, Satan's pride in all the devils, it's like a very proud boxer. A very proud boxer in the ring who never had a loss. He always wins. And he always defeats his opponents, mankind, brutally, except by the, when God's grace steps in. But imagine a huge boxer, a world-famous boxer, stepping into the ring with a little girl and being beaten. And she just stepping on his head. And that is a small comparison of the, the hatred Satan has for the Virgin Mary. Because it's given to this humble virgin girl, the most precious creation that God ever made, other than his own divine son. But even, even Jesus Christ, even his flesh, even his blood, even his most sacred heart, had to be firstly given by the blood of the Virgin Mary. Because God doesn't have a body. Where did he take the body? Through the blood, through the womb of the Virgin Mary. So Mary, her role is, is profound in our redemption. That's why she's called co-redemptress. That's why Archbishop Lefebvre and the great traditional bishops at Vatican II, uh, aside also from, from speaking out against the errors of liberalism and modernism come into the church, they also pushed for the, the Virgin Mary to be declared co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces. Of course, that was ignored. But she really is, because she prepared the Lamb to be slaughtered. She gave the Lamb, the living God, the, the second person of the Trinity, the flesh to be crucified for our redemption. So the role of the Virgin Mary is for us in these days, we must be very close to the Virgin Mary. Our, our, to put it in plain English, we're goners if we don't have a love and devotion to her. We're goners. We won't make it. But with her, you will, you will rise speedily in virtue, you will overcome sin, you will grow in the love of God, you will accept the cross as God gives us more patiently, because you will see she standing at the foot of the cross. You will discover through the Immaculate Heart of Mary a whole new world. And we got to thirst for that. we got to ask God and the Holy Ghost to move us to see everything through her Immaculate Heart. Because that is the devotion the Blessed Trinity has given for our dark times. So when you pray the Rosary, try to see the mysteries of Christ's life through her eyes. The Annunciation. The visitation, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, see it through her eyes. And she saw the little hands of Jesus born very soon at Christmas time, his birthday's coming. She saw those hands and she knew, the Virgin Mary knew the prophecies of Isaiah. She knew the prophecies of Jeremiah and of David a thousand years before Christ. They will pierce his hands and feet. He will look like a leper from head to foot. He will be the man abjected, scorned, thrown out of Jerusalem like the scapegoat, was thrown out of the city to die in the desert. And all the sacrifices of the Lamb, St. Justin describes the sacrifices of the Old Testament because he studied them to convert the Jews of his time. And he says, now remember this, the, the child Jesus, when he was your age, boys, when he was growing up, he went every year to the temple to see the sacrifices. And what did he see? He saw the priests performing the ceremonies, and they didn't even understand all that it meant. They didn't. But God laid down every detail of the, of the ceremonies. You can read them in the scriptures. And one of them was to take a stake, drive it up the, the rump of the back of the lamb. A one-year-old lamb without blemish, prefiguring Christ, innocent and spotless and pure and immaculate. And then another stake driven through the shoulders in a cross, 
So, and then the lamb hanging on the cross, bleeding. St. Justin says they would lower the lamb over the burning flame. And then he would, the priest would hold it high. Like the priest holds the true Jesus crucified at the mass. He holds him high to drive the devils away. To draw down the fire of grace from heaven. And little Jesus, with his mother, St. Joseph, he saw this. And I'm sure he saw many times tears coming out of his mother's eyes because she knew exactly what that meant. It would be her son. It would be Jesus crucified. That's why it was done for 400 something years to prepare for Jesus crucified. And this is why the, the, the sacrifice of the cross is the heart of the creed. It's the heart of the Catholic faith. And at the heart of the defense of the Catholic faith is always the Virgin Mary. When you find heretics attacking the Catholic faith, they always attack Mary first. In some way, she is attacked. But when Mary is defended, when she is held in honor, you keep the Catholic faith. It's always the same. It always has been. Every heresy, every attack, the Muslim invasions in the 600s and the, and the uh, 1500s and the in the uh, uh, 1700s in Vienna. The Virgin Mary always, always at the front line of defense. And even in the Cristero battles, the, uh, the first war in Kalima, all, there was only a handful, like here, just a handful to, to fight, a handful of men. And they had some you know, rusty rifles, but they said, we're not going to let them destroy our church and smash our altars. We're not going to let them kill our priests and our nuns. We're not going to let them mis abuse our women. And the men went out of their town and faced the coming Masonic armies. This was the first battle in Kalima. But what happened? It, when they started the battle, you know, these guys, okay, you guys, they, they always prayed to the Virgin Mary, they went to confession, communion before every battle, and they went to battle. And the, 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 the soldiers kept coming on their horses, they were shooting, they were shooting. There was a scuffle, it didn't last too long, 40 minutes. And suddenly, all these Cristeros, you know, about 50 of them, they see this huge army of 300, 400 soldiers turn around and run. And they were, they, the, the Cristeros, they didn't know anything would happen. They just, thank, give out a Virgin of Guadalupe, thank the Virgin Mary. They didn't know what happened, but what happened? They found out later that those soldiers coming on them, they didn't just see 50 poor, rough, hardly dressed soldiers. They saw a huge army, thousands. And they saw a woman in front on a horse. And every time they would shoot, they said that she would take the bullet in her. And it, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't harm her. And after a little scuffle, they, they just turned around in fear. They said, we can't beat these people. So the Cristeros at that time in Mexico, this is recorded in the history, they were very much thrilled with this because they knew they had the help of Our Lady and the angels. And that began, of course, the, the great battles for the Catholic faith. So at the heart of the, the defense of the faith is always the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And now we are, now, how can I say this? How can we say this? It's very sad what is happening now. And if you have the grace to see or the courage to come and, and hear and read and pray. This is something we never expected. I never expected this year to see our dear society, and I love the Society of Pais the It's my mother in the priesthood, Archbishop Lefebvre, by the guidance of the Holy Ghost, he consecrated the four bishops. And he told the four bishops, stay, stay united in the faith.
Stay united in the battle for tradition. Read his letter in 1988. It's beautiful. And he encourages the bishops to stay united. But it's very sad what happened this, this year. And I don't know. I, I have no answer except that we cannot go we cannot go along with the direction to Rome. We cannot to keep our faith, to keep our uh, the true mass, to keep the true sacraments, to save our soul. Because we have learned from nine traditional groups, St. Peter's, um, the Redemptorists, just this August, while under the diocesan bishop, they made a, an agreement with Rome. And do you hear from the Redemptorists anymore? Remember their beautiful magazine called Catholic? Remember that? And it went all over the world. They had a great apostle. I think they gave a mission here in St. Mary's a number of years ago. Now, they're ducked and they're straight -jacketed. They can't go in any other diocese. They can't preach against the Navasordo and the Vatican II. And this has happened to every single group that has made an agreement with Rome. And you know what also is interesting? All those groups had conditions. Every one of them set conditions. We want to have the freedom to say the true mass of all time. And Cardinal Ratzinger, who dealt with them, he said, sure, you can have that. And we want to be able to criticize Vatican II. That's what Campos said. And Rome said, sure, you can have that. And the Good, Inst Good Shepherd Institute, 2005, under Father, Father, Father Olanier, who was expelled by Bishop Fillet for wanting an agreement with Rome. And now the, the, the tables are turning. But what did they ask? They asked, we want the right to criticize and condemn modernism. And La Verreau Monastery, the great Benedictine monastery, up until 1988. When they compromised with Rome, Archbishop Lefebvre was in tears because he knew what that meant, and he was right. In five years, he said, they will have the new mass. And you know what else happened, which was worse? One of their priests, these priests who were asking Rome, we'll, we'll preach against modernism, we'll fight modernism, we'll convert the church from within. This is all a familiar tune that's been sung before. And what happened? One of the priests of the Benedictines wrote a defense of the document on religious liberty, which is, you lose the faith with that. Vatican II is like quicksand. It, it, it might look like normal, it might look safe to sit, step in certain areas, but once you're in it, you're gone. It's a spider's web, once you touch it, you're, you're gone. It's dangerous. And the Archbishop Lefebvre, who lived through the Vatican Council, he was there. He saw these rats. He saw these hyenas tearing down the tradition of the church right in front of his eyes. And Archbishop Lefebvre raised his voice, and Cardinal Ottaviani, and Cardinal Odi, a few traditional cardinals, and Cardinal Bishop de Castro Mayor was there. And they they saw the hijacking of this council. And they saw the cowardice, let's call it what it was, of the popes, who did not, did not stand up to these liberals. And Paul VI just let them run right over. So we all know the result of Vatican II. So dear friends, you're faithful. It's scary. It's frightening, it's, it's unbelievable that our dear society that has fought for 42 years this battle with the grace of God now has officially stated, officially in the documents, this is not rumors, this is not internet gossip. These are actual documents of the Society of Pius X of just this, Ju this July at the general chapter. And it's, it's very sad. What can I say? And the six conditions, 
say that it says we bind, the society binds itself to these conditions. And one of the conditions, as you know very well, is a very deadly one. A willingness to go under the local diocesan vision. And that, you know, dear faith, I don't need to tell you. What would happen to our dear St. Mary's, our school, the nuns, the priests, if they came under the local diocesan vision? I don't need to tell you much. The same bishops who have goof, goofy masses, the same bishops that have clown masses, every parish un under his diocese is filled with heresy, the priests don't have the faith, they ridicule the faith, if they even have the faith, and if, even if they're conservative, their, their faith is weak. So, how do we explain this? We can't. It's a mystery of iniquity. But the only way we will stay faithful is to be close to the Virgin Mary. And Archbishop Lefebvre, there, there are so many times, after 1988 especially, he said we must never make an agreement with Rome because we will lose our faith. He says we will be, we will be so uh, swamped, he uses that word, swamped, and we will be so pressured that we will rot. And Archbishop Lefebvre said it's impossible because he told Cardinal Ratzinger, you are going one direction with Vatican II. You want to tear down Jesus Christ, his kingship. You want to fight for the rights of man and trample the rights of God. And we, traditional Catholics, who are part of the church, we want to be restored all to Christ the King. We want his kingship over all society. We want to keep the true mass and permeate society, convert society, the whole world. So he said, we cannot make an agreement ever until Rome, what's the condition? Until Rome comes back to the tradition. Until Rome professes the faith of all the popes. Then, no problem. To use an example of Bishop Williamson, I mean, to put it very simply, it's like putting the chickens in, to make an agreement with the foxes. And the foxes say, sure, you can come into our den, no problem. And the chickens say, but we, we have some conditions. You know, don't cook us this way, don't let, we have to be able to do this, we have to be able to do that. And the wolves, of course, say, sure. It's happened already to nine traditional communities. And they were all devoured by the wolves. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre wept. Because he saw this great monastery, La Barou, in 1988, and he humbled. And we don't want to see this happening to our dear society. I don't. But I can't change what has happened. It is the official documents that the society is officially going towards the agreement with Rome. It is approved. It is determined to go ahead with it. There are six conditions that they bound themselves to. And with that comes a lot of uh, modernist ideas. Because priests can no longer preach out against modernism, as before. They are pressured not to preach out against Vatican II, as before. Archbishop Lefebvre, did he ever pull punches? He told Pope Paul VI, I cannot obey you. If I obey you, I disobey 262 popes before you. If I, if I disobey, if I, if I obey you, I disobey all these popes before you. I have to choose. Either I obey 262 popes and disobey you, Holy Father, or I obey you and disobey 262 popes. I want to stay with what the church has always taught. That is what's called Catholic tradition. And that's what we, dear faithful, and you must pray for, to be faithful, pray your rosary, pray it well, wear your scapula of Our Lady, pray at the Mass, visit our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, pray for Bishop Follet, pray for all the priests, because this is, uh, the devil, as you know, is raging mad. He knows his time is short, 
And you know as well as I, there has been only one last bastion keeping Catholic tradition. And you don't think he wants to infiltrate that? You don't think he wants to split that down the middle? You don't think he wants to tear that down? So we must resist this, this trend towards the liberalism. And that will make Marcus as true sons of our Lord, true sons of our Lady, true sons of Archbishop of Faith. And you're going to get persecuted for it. What does St. Paul say to the Catholics of his day? Those who will live piously in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. And already we have seen Bishop Williamson sadly expelled. And the reason, they give a lot of excuses. The reason is because he opposed very openly the agreement with Rome. And all the good priests throughout the world who are speaking out, they are all being silenced and expelled. It's happening. It's not fiction. It's not gossip. It's happening. And it's very sad. And I can't explain it. But we do know the battle of Satan with Christ. So no one can make you lose your faith. And little children, seven years old, went to martyrdom in Mexico. Women, men, went to their death in the Vendée, in the Ukraine, in Ireland, and in uh, France during the French Revolution. They had to have mass in barn. They had a mass in... I said Mass last week in a garage. It's back to the old days, isn't it? But once that agreement is made, the SSPX is no longer the traditional bastion. It will crumble. So pray, pray, dear faithful, pray to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And in this Mass, let's ask the Immaculate Heart to give us a great love for the true Mass for the love of the true faith, and never <coughs> compromise. And that means you all and influence others in a good way, with a charitable spirit, a spirit of the faith. Get others to reread Archbishop of Faith, reread his sermons, reread his conferences. They have uncrowned him. All you men should be well acquainted with that book. It's solid. And I accuse the council. Unfortunately, it's out of print for some strange reason. But if you can get a hold of that, Read it. The Archbishop is very clear. There was no confusion. And he was very clear. And I'll close with this. We can never make a practical agreement with Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. He said that three times in his sermon when he consecrated the bishop. And he insisted on it from 1988 until his death. And he said in his day, Rome has lost the faith. Rome has lost the faith. It is certain, it is certain, it is certain. He said that many times. What would he say now? With Assisi last year, and just last week, the Holy Father announced the need for a one world government, a one world banking system, a one world religion. That is out of the mouth of the Vicar of Christ. And you know what Pope St. Pius X, he warned the the Antichrist is not far off, he said, and the enemies of Christ want to form a one world religion, a one world government, based on the, for the Antichrist. And if these are our days to fight, and maybe to die for the faith, let's pray for that strength. But we must never compromise and pray for that grace. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us. In the Father, the Son, Holy Ghost.